Time to talk some Royals baseball again here on the Kaufman Corner Podcast. With you as always, Soren Petro, Sports Radio 810 WHB. That is the good doctor, Dr. Randy Gisarli with you as we will break down whether or not it's safe to come out and actually enjoy and embrace this season. Uh, you know, everyone just keeps saying, are the Royals for real? Are they for real? When will it be? If it's not now, how long do they have to go before you can honestly wrap your arms around these Royals and believe? Uh, we'll talk about that. Seth Lugo, how good is he? What's the level of confidence we should all have in the Royals' bullpen? Salvador Perez is hurt. First kind of injury of the year. Doesn't look like it's going to be too serious. And when might we see Michael Massey back? A lot of people thought he might be back today. Not the case. It's all coming up right now here on the Coffin Corner Podcast. You're listening to Kaufman Corner, the most in-depth analysis of the Kansas City Royals, breaking down the Royals like no one else can. Kaufman Corner is hosted by Randy Gisarli and Soren Petro. Randy is a co-founder of Baseball Prospectus, author of Randy on the Royals, and former columnist for Grantland, The Ringer, and The Athletic. Soren is the award-winning afternoon drive host of the program on Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Kaufman Corner is proudly brought to you by GAN Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, and every project comes with a written warranty. Find them online at ganasphalt.com or call 816-484-3338. GAN Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Now, here's your hosts, Randy Gisarli and Soren Petro. Thank you, Curtis. Back at it here on the Coffin Corner Podcast. And uh, time to get into it. Like, is it is it time? Are we ready to come out for a big group hug and believe the dark, cold days of the past are over and it's back to contending baseball, Randy? Where do we sit? They did drop two or three to the Mets, which had some people I know putting out some negative, uh, you know, negative kind of vibes when it came to the ball club bounce back with a good two nothing win keep losing teams losing Royals sure so far this year have shown they know how to do that with the Chicago White Sox where are you at as far as the safety of uh, embracing this is going as a, as a season that's going to be uh, one of contention throughout at least most of the year well Soren I don't think it's safe to believe in the Royals yet I think it is safe to root for the Royals to be a team that we can believe in. Like, it's not... Are you running for office later tonight? (laughs) I'd like to announce my platform, uh, Jobs for Everyone, uh, and I am eliminating all taxes as well. So, um, no, the point point is, it's, you know, 17 games is, it's, it's, we've just crossed the 10% mark of the season. Right. If this were the NFL, we would be uh, in the middle, you know, the, the late in, in game, late in week two of the season. So it's still very early. And yet at the same time, 10 percent is 10 percent. Like that's not nothing. Right. And the Royals are five games over 500. They've the, the, the they've only been five games above 500 at any point in any season. Like, I think, three times since they won the World Series in any season. Um, so. It's it's yeah you know we you could be we could be getting burned here if we get too excited. Three years ago they were sixteen and nine. That was one of the times they were more than five games above five hundred, uh, and they ended up losing eighty eight games. But there are reasons above and beyond the record here to say this might be different. This might be different than the than previous years where they got off to a hot start, but the underlying metrics suggested a team playing over its head, a team that was just lucky in close games. The, 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 what makes this season unusual and what makes it so fascinating, just take being a Royals fan out of it, but as an analyst and, and non-Royals fan analysts, I, I think will agree with this. What makes it fascinating is the deeper you dig into the metrics of how this team is playing, the less of a fluke it looks like. So, like what I what I would say is, I, I don't know that the Royals are a good team or go, are going to have a good season or going to have a good record for the season. I can say definitively, they are playing like a good team, a really good team, right now. I don't know how long that'll last, but I think we've reached the point now where we have to start taking it seriously. 
and start taking this team's chances of contention seriously. And that's not just me speaking. That is people like Dan Zimborski at Fangraphs who wrote a very a very nice, uh, and if you're a Royals fan, um, you know, a, a shockingly optimistic article about where, how the Royals have played to this point and uh, and their chances of continuing this for the rest of the season. Um, I, I think that's, listen, I, I, the, the, the question here, do we make it about a prediction? You know, is, is that, is that what it is? Like, like, do you have to predict that they're going to win the division to buy in question is, are they going to contend, right? Like I have this adage for football. The Royals haven't won enough in my broadcasting career for me to come up with all these benchmarks that I've, that I've come up with over the years for the chiefs. But I used to say, if you go into week 16 back in the old days, 17, go to the last game of the season, and you're still in contention for the playoffs, that's a successful football season. Right. Playing 16 meaningful games, having 16 lead-ups at least that are all meaningful. You're not eliminated. And so in baseball, that would translate using your you know second quarter of the second game or wherever we are, or beginning the second quarter of the, the second game. That, that would be, um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, it's getting into mid-September. It's still having a shot. If the last two weeks you're out, okay, that's still a successful season. And so, like, I, it, I, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One, I mean, it's better baseball. Enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Don't spend all this time, you know, you know, being the 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 character from major leagues. Like, oh, they're just going to blow it in the end. Well, then, if only one team is going to be successful in the end, why do we even play the sport? If 29 teams the year is trash, okay, playoff teams, that's it. All right, well, I would tell you to soften it up a little bit. I think the question is, are they going to be a good team? And where is the division? I mean, it's almost as much about do you believe in the Guardians and where they're at? Because are the Royals going to keep this pace up? No, neither are the Guardians. But are they more likely to keep up a better pace? Then, okay, then there's a reason to be a little more pessimistic. But for the wild card pace – Maybe this division is going to be a lot better. They're not going to be the bottom feeder. Maybe you can get two teams in. And wild card traditionally says, you know, mid eighties season puts you in contention going into the final week of the year. So uh, yes, my prediction is no, they'll fall short because I don't think they're deep enough because they're going to have injuries and they don't have the replacements for it. But like right now when everybody's healthy, and I said this today, they're much more likely to be healthy because they're younger. Right? They're not an old team. So young teams stay healthier. So if they're going to have a magically healthy season, you be, you're best to have most guys in their 20s, and that's this team. And yeah. so there, there's there's pros and cons, but don't miss the ride that's fun. Even if you don't get to go all over the park, if you get a third of the park in and it was a fun third, don't miss it because you're you're, you're too worried you might get burnt in September. Absolutely. No, I, I, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, I'm not, uh, to me, it's the season's not a success only if they make the playoffs, right? The season is a success. If, like you said, they play meaning, meaningful baseball in September coming off of 106 losses. That's, that's a significant accomplishment. And my, my point is that given what the Royals have done to this point, I'll, I think it's already, it would be a surprise and a disappointment if barring you know a rash of injuries which absolutely could tank this but if the royals stay even reasonably healthy i think it would i would at this point be quite surprised if they ended up losing 90 games or more right i mean we granted we both predicted they wouldn't we both predicted you know mid 70s win totals but mid 70s win totals is you know would itself be a decent step forward to me that is almost the downside at this point like, um, you know, some somebody in my, in my Twitter comments made a very good uh, sort of um, cautionary tale case of last year's Pittsburgh Pirates, who were coming off a 100-loss season, and were, I think, 20-9 and nine before that team kind of fell apart. But even the Pittsburgh Pirates last year went 76-86. and 86. Like, if that's the, the downside of this year's uh, Kansas City Royals, as a downside, that's fine. That 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 downside was my median expectation three weeks ago. Um, but here's the thing: I don't think we need to 
you know, worry too much yet about what the Guardians are doing. You know, frankly, with the Wild, you know, if the Royals play this well, the Wild card is very much in play, even if they don't win the division. But we have to start taking seriously the possibility that this is a 500 or better team. Um, and that's it's kind of a shocking thing to say this early in the season. But I want to I want to bring up this point that Dan Zimborski made um, at Fangraphs. It's not just that the Royals have banked, you know, the, the five games above 500 that they are now. It's that the projections for this team for the rest of the season have gotten so much better just in three weeks. He makes the point here that before the season, their projection system had the Royals as a, a t- as a team that had a 452 winning percentage. That was their projection, a 452 winning percentage. As of today, as before t- tonight's game, so it might be even better now, it was 486. That's a 34-point improvement, which is, what, five games over the course of the season. That's not counting the wins they've already had. That's saying how they'll play from here on out. And 34 points may not sound like a lot. No other team in baseball had improved their projection by more than 10. And that is a testament to how the players are playing. He brings up Cole Reagans, which I think to you and I, most Royals fans, we were, you know, he hasn't he hasn't pitched that much better than we expected. But, you know, there's no guarantee of what he did with the Royals last year. You can't just ignore what he did before the Royals got him. And projection systems were understandably a little conservative. He has picked up exactly where he left off. The Royals have not given him any support, but he's pitched exactly as well, if not even slightly better than we expected. So he's been great. We all thought Bobby Witt was a star, but you know Bobby Witt is now introducing like Alex Rodriguez possibilities. There, there are A-Rod comps now in what Bobby Witt is doing uh, this season. Tonight, he went over four, but like just missed a grand slam. If the weather had been a little bit better in Chicago, he probably would have had a grand slam. Um, another hard hit ball leading the majors and hard hit balls and you know, barrel precision. His, his metrics are just video game numbers in terms of the way he's hitting the ball. Um, Brady Singer, he, he, these are the, the, the pitch, uh, the players that Dan Zamorski is making his, his projection, Brady Singer's projection. He's throwing that four, new four seam, pit, uh, fastball, his, you know, swing and miss rate. He's getting a higher percentage of swing and misses. It's not just looking at strikeouts and walks, but actual like pitch by pitch data. He is getting guys to swing and miss at more of his stuff. Um, you know, MJ Melendez, obviously, you know, the defense is still shaky, but the offense has improved. That doesn't even count like Vinny Pasquantino, who in the span of five days has gone from like one of the worst hitters in the sport to well above average is just on fire right now. So the individual players doing this make even a computer system say, this team is better than we thought it was at the beginning of the year. So, you know, again, don't buy your playoff tickets yet, but well, it's okay to be a little bit excited about what they're doing. Yeah, and, and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm fine with all that. I think all of it's accurate. What, are they, what, are the, what did all the systems miss? Right? It's almost to me to, to, to be like, okay, is this team built for the long haul? It, it's, it's almost a better practice instead of analyzing the numbers now because it's such a small sample size. Guys can be hot. Do we think, you know, Bobby Wood Jr. is going to OPS 1,100? I don't because he's never come close to that. And he was 1,300 a week ago, right? It's still just so high up there. But we, one of the things we said about why you could buy in a week ago was Vinny Pascatino hadn't started to hit. Right. And now he's hitting. And so as others cool off, we believed in the talent that was there. But I I would be curious because I I love the analytics, but everyone I know that works in analytics at the end of a year, they're like, well, we're tweaking our system. Well, why? Well, we didn't get the numbers we wanted. Well, what did you want? You're you're working back. You had this eye test then that you wanted to achieve. Basically, you had your opinion, and you're looking for numbers that will back your opinion up. And when it comes off, well, we got to put more weight on this, or we got to put more weight on that. And so, like, put a system together and let's play to it. I, I think that's one of the things that the Rays have been good at is these are the data, th- these are the data points that are important. Now let's build to those data points, and that's what I see the Royals doing. Right? It's not like they're not trying to tweak and, like, which is what kind of what happened in the previous regime. When you weren't the team you said you always wanted to be, well, pitching is the currency in baseball. Well, contact, and, you know, it'd suddenly be something else to fit the mold of what that team is. These guys had data points, and they've gone out and built to the data points, mm-hmm. right? And it's and it's succeeding. And, and when do we start to buy run differential? Because what happens is when a team's kind of bad or 
you know, oh God, they're they're bad. But guess what? They're even worse because they've been outscored by 120. That's what it was last year. Yeah, the record's bad, but believe me, they're even worse because the run differential is terrible. Well, now as the number of people have pointed out here tonight, they have the best run differential in baseball. Mm -hmm. So, like, at what point does the conversation go to? Are they the best team in baseball? Because by you know, and 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 the answer is no. It's still too early. Still, still not enough data points. But for you, when do you start to buy the run differential? When do the Dodgers officially become the best team in baseball because their run differential is forty runs better than everybody else? When does that apply to the Royals? I mean, it it definitely lends a heck of a lot more credence to what they're doing because, like I said, when you when you look at what the Royals did in, in 2021 when they were 16 and nine, they, they were outscored in April in 2003, which, you know, we, the, the pen, you know, the ultimate example of the Royals just going on an all time heater in April and you know coming off a hundred loss season, making everyone think that, Oh my God, this is going to be a miracle season. They were 17 and four at one point in, in late April. Um, and they had outscored their opponents by 37 runs. In fewer games right now, the Royals have a better run differential. They're plus 39. Uh, if you go back 2009, that was Zach Grinke's Cy Young year. They started 18 and 11 before famously falling off and losing 95 games. When they were 18 and 11, they were plus 33 run differential. They have a better run differential in 17 games than they did that year in 29 games. So the run differential is absolutely, um, you know, a, a mark of quality above and beyond the record, but it's not just a run differential. It's like, look, look how they're doing it. They're third in the American league in home runs. They're still first in steals. Like the, the classic Royals trademark of, you know, run, 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 run. Yeah. Okay. They can run, but you know, that's all they could do. They're first in steals. They're ninth in caught stealing. They're not just running a lot. They're running efficiently. They're 20 out of 23 on stolen base opportunities. All three caught stealings are Bobby Witt. Um, I, I will forgive him. Um, so that means the rest of the team was a perfect 17 for 17 in stolen bases opportunities. Daron Blanco is five for five and is like scored on like four different pinch running uh, scenarios, which, you know, you might not get four runs from a pinch runner all season uh, for some teams. They are sixth in batting average. They're sixth in walks. The Kansas City Royals right now are sixth in walks. They've given up the fewest home runs in the game, in, in, in the American League, I think maybe in, in the whole major leagues. Nine total after today, 151 innings, nine home runs. That's an incredible ratio. There's actually, though, you want to know what's funny? There's one category that the Royals are dead last in the American League in. Do you want to know what it is? Uh, strikeouts? Strikeouts by the pitching staff. You just talk about pitch to contact. The Royals pitch to like that has been this pejorative for you know the entire Dayton Moore era is oh you don't want guys to pitch to contact. No, even Allard Baird was all about pitch to contact. When you pitch to contact, it usually means your guys don't have stuff to get guys out. I mean, it's early, it's only 17 games. But the Royals are succeeding like beyond their wildest dreams here. They're they they have the, they've given up the fewest runs in the American League with the lowest strike, the fewest strikeouts in the league as well. And it's actually really interesting because, you know, Seth Lugo went out there today. He's sort of the poster boy for this. He is I mean, he definitely. came into the game, into the season, nine strikeouts are coming tonight's game, nine strikeouts in 18 and two thirds. Today, he had four strikeouts in seven innings. That's a terrible strikeout to walk ratio, uh, strikeout to innings ratio. But he's done everything else so well. He's actually that rare guy who can pitch to contact. He gets ground balls. He doesn't walk anybody. And yeah, he's been a little lucky. He's got a 105 ERA. Yeah, that's not sustainable. And I'm a little bit worried that, you know, he's got to start missing a few more bats or that's not going to keep up. Um, but the point is that the Royals are, they kind of have an identity here, which is their starters pitch deep into ball games. They're efficient. They've got the most innings in the major leagues out of their starting rotation. Who would have guessed that at the beginning of the year, right? So, so the bullpen, which might be a weakness, one way to limit that weakness is to just require very few innings out of your bullpen. Um, so to me, really what it comes down to is just health. If this team stays healthy, and that's something we can talk about, I think the talent, the, the baseline talent here is actually better than we thought it was. Um, and that is might be enough to keep them in contention for most of the season. 
The Kaufman Corner Podcast is proudly brought to you by our friends at GAN Asphalt and Concrete with free consultations, no commissions, all in-house crews, every project coming with a written warranty. Uh, why would you go anywhere else? GAN Asphalt keeps your parking lot safer, helps you and your business avoid unnecessary delays and costly expenses. Find them online at GANASphalt.com. One contractor, all things parking lot, GAN Asphalt and Concrete, online at GANASphalt.com. Um, we have the question, Michael Garcia in the leadoff. When, when do you? He, he's cooled off from his, you know, very brief hot start. When do you look at juggling the lineup? I I still think he should be in the leadoff spot in part because I I just I think he is a good hitter. He's hit up really rough stretch here. Um, but I want my best hitters towards the top of the lineup. Um, and I think it might actually encourage him to take more pitches, which I think is better, good for him developing plate discipline. He he actually um you know he drew a walk today. Um, I think you know. That might be sort of kind of like with Vinny. I think that getting getting his bat back on track sometimes just requires him to take a few pitches and try and get ahead in this in, in the count. Um, it's again, it's still April, so wild fluctuations of performance can happen in five days. You know, a week ago when we were talking, Michael Garcia was was you know had a OPS three hundred points higher than than Pasquantino, and now Pasquantino has a much higher OPS than he does. Um, I, I don't think there's any any concern with with um, moving him down in the lineup, in part because I'm not sure who exactly you'd move up. I mean, yeah, you can put Melendez in the leadoff spot or Witt in the leadoff spot. I, like, I like where those guys are. And the, to me, more important than the lineup right now is just who's playing. And I'm really impressed with how Quintero, I mean, he, you know, if we're going to have to flip the switch from, you know, rebuilding to contending, you know, you, you want to have a manager who can perform both uh, both tasks uh, equally well, and we have no idea how, how he'll be as a tactical manager coming into the season, but I've been very impressed with what I've seen from him so, so far. I mean, like Hunter Renfro, give, give me an example, Hunter Renfro was signed to be an everyday starting outfielder. Renfro has performed about as poorly as you and I will worry he would, and kind of quietly I mean, he wasn't in the lineup today. Like, he's, you know, he started sixth in the lineup. He was moved down to eighth in the lineup. He's getting days off against certain right-handers, you know, without, you know, hopefully, presumably without, like, losing the clubhouse, without creating friction. Quattro is trying to get more offense, you know, in the lineup. He's, you know, an established veteran guy who's been playing every day for years. He's been able to keep him on the bench without creating problems. At the same time, when the Royals went up against Sean Manaya over the weekend, left-hander throws three quarters delivery has a very large platoon split for his career he started nine right-handed bats in the lineup the entire uh, preseason bench the four guys freddie Fermin, um garrett hampson uh nick uh nick lofton um and uh Dyron blanco who got his first start all four of those guys were in the lineup all four of them contributed, and the Royals scored 11 runs in the game. They, they benched him. You know, Pasquantino got a day off. Even Melendez got a day off. It's like, wow, this is an interesting lineup. But if you're going to do it, he picked the right guy to get all of his bench players in the game. They played very well. So at, right now, I'm trusting that Couture kind of has has a his finger on the pulse of what this lineup should look like. I, I, I uh, yeah, I'm I'm impressed with Matt Couture. A lot of people down on him last year, and I'm like, no, we we said it. What does he have to work with? Right. We have How can no you idea what you do? And and I think right now, I, listen. As far as would I bet on them to win the division? No, I wouldn't. But do I? Can I see a path there? I can. But man, MJ Melendez and Velasquez as your corner outfield. Kyle's Bell's really good. He better be. You know, Melendez looks better. I'm going to give him a lot of credit. He's still not fluid and smooth, and there ain't no Ricky basket catches, right? Like. He gets there and has got to concentrate all the way into the mid, but he's getting to the spot. And he had made a great play at the plate. Obviously, the place right. he's got, got an arm. He's definitely got the arm. And he, and he had and he had, but you can have an arm and airmail it twenty feet over sure. the catcher's head. I mean, he was accurate. So, yeah, I, I'm listen. The longer it goes, obviously, the more we all believe there are signs. And I, your point about the Saturday game against Manaya, where he said, "Okay, this is my getaway day lineup." And I'm going to take advantage of the splits. Stealing wins on those days, critical. Critical. I mean, you, you've got to be able to get wins. Those can't just be forfeits. But I do worry, you know, Salvi goes down. The the injury thing is what scares me, right? Yeah, like, 
if 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 those start to pile up, I don't I don't see the answers coming to fix it in the minor leagues. Do you? No, I mean they're you know it's 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 interesting. Like we talked about this last week, how the, you know, the Royals hadn't made a single transaction, hadn't used you know anybody outside their twenty six players on their you know opening day roster. A week later, they still have not made a transaction. Believe it or not, there's actually one other team in the sport in in baseball. Joe Sheehan pointed this out in his newsletter recently uh, that has not uh, not made a single transaction and has used 26 players. The Colorado Rockies of all teams have only used 26 players. The difference is the Rockies suck. The Rockies are four and 12. Um, good for them that they haven't needed to, you know. But maybe they, maybe they do need to make the moves and they just haven't. Um, but the point is, it's 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 a tribute to the fact that, like you said, the Rose are a fairly young team. They haven't had any major injuries. Hopefully, we dodged a bullet here with Salvi, who's you know sometimes feels feels indestructible of things that you see, you know, the abuse you see him take on the field. Um, but look, at the same time, they are going to have to make you know roster moves. They're going to have to use more than thirteen pitchers. Do you know what the average major league team? How many pitchers the average major league team? used last season 25 i believe it was 28.8 wow i mean that's i mean it's just mind-blowing like essentially when you think about no team has that many pitchers on their 40-man roster at any given time which just tells you like how many how many moves you're gonna have to make involving guys who are not even on your 40-man roster um, but really what, what is going to make or break the season is just how, how few pitchers, how little turnover the Royals can manage with this roster, because, you know, if, 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 uh, Salvi goes down, you know, he has to go on the injured list. I know they, had, they brought up Logan Porter to like the taxi squad traveling with the team, which I was pleased to see that it was Logan Porter who actually is quietly, you know, doing what he's kind of always done in the mind of which is rake. He was hitting the crap out of it. I think we might have been the um, player of the week last week. In, in, 1,400 uh, OPS right now. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, I, maybe he's not a great defensive catcher, but he, you know, he he's such an offensive force that, like, if we have to go with him for a few weeks, it's not the end of the world. Um, if, you know, they need an outfielder, Drew Waters is doing what he's done since he joined the Royals organization, which is hitting AAA. Um, so, you know, they can, they can, fake an uh, fake an injury out there and then you mentioned michael massey and why he hasn't come back yet i'm a little surprised by that i mean it he's from chicago i just figured oh you know he's, you know want to play in front of his his, his family and hometown fans um and he seems ready because he was you know after uh one terrible game in double they moved him up to omaha and i think he went nine for 19 with some with some pop um the the so presumably he'll be back in a few days, but the but the the issue is, and this is something that was there since the moment they signed Adam Frazier, is the player that you want to pair with him in terms of skill set is Nick Lofton. Adam Frazier is basically a slightly worse version of Michael Massey, but you can't send Adam Frazier to the minor leagues. Like you know, I I, I would if we could stash Frazier in AAA. I think that would be great. I don't mean that to insult the guy as a free agent who signed for four and a half million dollars. I think it's a depth piece, exactly what we're seeing right now with Michael Massey out. I mean, he's not hitting much, but he's got a 370 OBP. And, you know, you, you have a 370 on base, you're going to have value to your club. Um, it's just that having both him and Michael Massey at the same time on the roster with Nick Lofton and AAA is kind of, you're not you're not rearranging your talent very well because you have nobody getting really lefties there. Um, but the point is, when Massey gets back, then they'll have Nick Lofton in Omaha, so they can again. If somebody else goes gets hurt, if Michael Garcia goes down, they can move some you know bring up Lofton and have him play third base. The question is, if they lose more than one player, I really don't know what they're going to do at some of these positions. They just don't have a lot of depth at AAA. Yeah, I don't, especially pitching. <laughs> I mean, I, I you know, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not pretty down there. You know, Jonathan Bolin is the one guy that you look at and go, okay, all right, we we got something there. But otherwise, I'm not sure where you turn. And I think that that might be the pill that's really hard for Royals fans to swallow. They can't trade anybody. 
not not anybody that's real. What are you going to do? Like if they if they're in it, you know they've got to cross their fingers and hope that this is just going to be a healthy year. Because in May, if Cole Reagans has an oblique and is going to be out eight weeks, and Alec Marsh has already gone down, and then hey, we need to skip Seth Lugo. Like where are you going? Are you really going to go trade what little bit you've got in your system for what? Like a temporary fix in a year that like that's the thing is like as we sit here, I'm I'm up I'm with you. I'm kind of optimistic. I don't think they're gonna lose hundred games anymore. I don't think they're probably gonna lose ninety games. There's a long season to go and injuries will determine where they go. Like right now, if they stay healthy, no, I, I think they should be a five hundred plus club, right? But and like you know, how close do you gotta get? How far up do you gotta be to say that we're you know in a time where they're They've already stated they have to build back the system. Are you going to go and trade from the system for a stopgap in a year that three weeks later you might have an injury that makes that irrelevant, the move you just made irrelevant anyway? It's it's going to be a really um, thorny situation. I mean, a, a pleasantly thorny situation if you are find yourself in kind of surprise contention with, you know, very, very weak farm system. Um you know, they're going to need to get a, some relievers. And I do think you can trade for relievers without, you know, even in a weak system, without rating the top five or 10 prospects in your system. Um, the, the problem will be if they need a starter, right? Like right now, if somebody goes down, Jordan Lyles is there. Okay, Jordan, Jordan, Jordan Lyles is a proven major league starter. The Royals need a proven quality major league starter i'm not sure we can go there with him but for an emergency purposes if somebody sure. could just slop absolutely if they need another starter and most teams need you know minimum eight starters to get through a season right and you know you'll probably need more than that but let's say eight okay then is daniel lynch that guy again for one or two starts if somebody you know has a minor injury maybe Beyond that, I don't know that he, that he's got the stuff to do it. And then the other guy that I think you know might actually get fit, fill fill this role and might be surprisingly good is on Hell Serpo. I mean, he's pitching well out of the bullpen, and he has always been that guy. You just quietly, you know, he's made starts for the team and has done well in the past. And frankly, I'd rather at this point it's, it's you know. It, it, it's him or I don't know what. So it's like I'd rather take a chance with Angel Serpa in 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 that spot than to bring up even Jonathan Bolin. And and after Bolin, it's you know Anthony Veneziano maybe, um, or it's guy or then you're looking at guys off you know that are not on the forty man roster or you're claiming guys off waivers from other teams, and you know that gets a little bit too close to the two thousand and three Royals for comfort. Like Jose Lima's not out there in the Atlantic League, you know and. That, that that's not going to work this time around. So um, they just have to help they stay healthy because the rotation has been by far the, the biggest strength of this team, but it's, it just takes one injury and the Royals lack of depth will be exposed there. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, a couple people said, Hey, the trade chip they've got is Salvi. And now he's got a groin injury. I uh, says he'll be back that supposedly he lobbied to be in the game tonight. He says he'll be back tomorrow. Uh, where's your concern on this? <sighs> I'm, I mean, I'm taking them at their word that he's probably going to be back tomorrow. Like, if if they thought he was going to be out for even f- five or five to seven days, he'd be on the ten day uh, injury list. Like, I, you can't go, you can't fake a catcher injury. Like, you can't have one active catcher on your roster. So, the fact that they did not make a transaction today makes me feel pretty confident that he's going to be able to play. And we've seen this with Salvi before. He's taken, you know, whether it's you know, foul foul balls off his you know his hands or collisions like this one at the plate, and it looked terrible. And he's not just starting, but like catching nine innings within forty eight hours. So I, so fortunately, he's he's just he's not indestructible because obviously he missed an entire season with Tommy John surgery. Although that seemed to invigorate him, and he's been a dramatically better hitter ever since. Um, but at this point, I I think we you know we we narrowly missed. Uh, a real problem. Yeah, you can't trade. Obviously, if you you didn't didn't, didn't trade him when you were uh, about to lose 106 games, you're certainly not about to trade him when you're about to be you know thinking of contention. Um, 
I do think that even if the farm system is terrible, though, I think if the roles stay in the race into June, July, I think, yeah, you've got to you you've got to be willing to trade even a good prospect if that's going to help you win now. Like you 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 can't just throw away an opportunity to make the playoffs. Flags so, still fly forever. So the Brewers don't know what they're doing. The Brewers who have traded Corbin Burns, right. who have traded Josh Hader, and keep winning because they say we're just going to keep acquiring more talent. And we're not going to worry about where we are in the standings. We're going to make the right move for the long haul all the time. And eventually that'll add up. And, and you know, for them, they were already in that point. But as long as you always do that, you'll have more talent tomorrow than you have today. And that's the goal. So you are against what the Milwaukee Brewers do? Absolutely not, because the Brewers have proven they can develop more talent from within. If And, and my hope is that if the Royals go out, I mean – the, the Brewers aren't trading Corbin Burns at the trade deadline, all right? They traded Josh Hader, which was fascinating, but Josh Hader is a reliever. And, you know, like, just like the Royals trading a role to step in, yeah, of course they weren't going to keep him. But the point is, is that relievers just don't move the needle that much. I don't think the Royals should make a trade that hurts for a reliever. I think that, like they should avoid the top end of the bullpen market, but they may just need some depth pieces. And you can, you can trade – you know, a, a, the fifteenth best prospect in your system for you know the Jason or Jason Fraser trade, if you remember the roles from ten years ago or whatever. Just get a guy who can give you thirty decent innings of a three fifty ERA, um, so that you're not blowing tons of leads. Like at some point, Will Smith, if he doesn't get it together, is going to be a transaction casualty. Like the Royals can't survive with with him on the roster if he's pitching like this all year long. But like like Chris Stratton today, Chris Stratton yesterday went out there and gave up two runs that the stri- the strike zone was really erratic, but still he walked four batters in inning lost the game. Q put him back out there today and he went one two three. Like that was also an impressive you know, that could have blown up in Quintero's face, but Stratton is a decent pitcher. Decent pitchers are going to have bad days, but he's going to have more good days than bad days as long as these guys are just average. The bullpen I think they'll be fine for now. I think MacArthur is a real weapon as the closer. And I think that if they just add one or two depth pieces between now and the trade deadline and the bullpen, they'll be okay. I'm really surprised. It's always amazing to me that it's all analytics and then until we don't want to be analytics, right? Like if this room, if if the people in the chat room and you and I were JJ Piccolo and his lieutenants Mm -hmm. sitting around talking about this team, what is the conclusion about the team? Conclusion would be from the conversation we've had and the comments I put up from the chat room, which, by the way, if you're catching us later on, you can be a part of the conversation. Uh, we stream live normally on Sunday nights at 10, coming to you Monday night this week. But the conclusion would be that we like our team on the field now, but we don't think we've got enough depth. We, we think we've still got work to do, and we're going to have to. We, we think we can be healthy because we're young, but in all likelihood, it sounds to me like our consensus would be it might work out, but I wouldn't bet on it. So if that's the case, why wouldn't you follow the analytics? And if you get a chance to move a 30 some odd year old catcher for talent on down the future, why wouldn't you do that? Well, for one thing, because analytics say, if you've got a chance to make the playoffs now, you're willing to trade, you know, two to two, let's say you, you trade two or three wins next year for one win this year. If you think if if we get to June or July and the Royals are still surprising everybody by being in the race, if anything, they might have a better chance of making the playoffs this year than they will next year or the year after that, in part because, you know, the, the, if they're still playing well at that point, it means that like their, their starters are staying healthy, their starting pitchers are still healthy. You know, Seth Lugo and Michael Waka will be gone next year and Seth Lugo the year after that. So if you don't believe that your farm system is going to be ready to deliver more talent in the you know next year or the year after, but you have a chance to steal a playoff spot this year. It's a perfectly reasonable strategy from an analytics perspective to trade away wins in the future for a win this year, because that win this year might improve your playoff odds. But the question was about Salvador Perez. Well, well, Salvador Perez, for one thing, he has a, he has a no trade. Call. I mean, he's, he's a 10 and five player. He can't be traded without his permission. Right. I know that but I, mean, I, I think it's listen, I don't I don't want to get bogged down in the minutiae. I think it's important to understand 
the smart people that everybody in this town when the Royals are losing 100 games point to and say, these are the guys who do it right. Now you get one little nibble and one little taste, and because it wouldn't be what fits you, fits what we want to hear right now, we don't want to do it. The Brewers continue. To your point about you, you gave the answer. Well, it, because the Brewers can develop talent. If this organization, if this front office doesn't believe that they can develop talent, it's over. You quit. Like that, that That's not even an option. You have to believe that you can develop talent because it's the only way to succeed. And you have to believe that you can win trades. You have to believe that you can make guys better when they get here. Right now, the early returns are the Royals can do that. So I, I'm just bringing it up to ready people that if this team is four and a half out, chasing the Guardians with the Twins right right behind them and five and a half out of the wild card, and they make a move for the future, don't lose your mind. They're making the smart move. Sure, they're making sure. the big if, picture move. If they're Moves four and a the half, Bulls have made five and a half, and a half out. So yeah, no, no. Well, I mean, and again, it's it's all a matter of where they are. If they are five games out of a playoff spot, then yeah, at that point, you probably you play to the future. Maybe you stand pat. You don't you don't go all in for sure. But if they get to July and they're still somehow like they they they're a game out of first place and they're actually they have a wild card spot in hand, then you can't trade for the, you know, trade for the future of that. Like I'm one of the, the biggest advocates for trading for Salvador Perez over the last couple of years. But if you didn't trade him when, you know, you were losing hundred games to trade him now, when you actually might have a chance, it just, it just, it depends it on what like you weird get. timing. It depends on what you can get. Sure. It, it, it's, it's what it always comes down to. And I do think that his value in the trade market was never as great as Royals fans wanted it to be in part because he's making a lot of money. And but he, he's he's angels. Apparently, I mean, that, the other thing, the thing we have to consider here is he keeps hitting, keeps playing at a at a level that I didn't think you know a catcher with the amount of mileage on his on his body, who's thirty four years old or will be thirty four in a month. Um, I didn't know that he was capable of doing this. So all all credit to him that he still seems to be, despite his flaws of swinging at everything, he still seems to be a very productive player. And that contract is not, you know, he maybe he's not a bargain, but he's not overpriced either. So credit to him. Gain Asphalt and Concrete is nationally recognized. Full service paving and pavement maintenance contractor. Parking lot problems. They've been making them disappear since 1994. You can find them online at ganasphalt.com. A uh, brightly striped uh, lot uh, is one that cuts down on accidents, cuts down on liability, lets you focus on your business. If you own a business or you manage a business, uh, keep your parking lot in top shape with Gain Asphalt and Concrete. One contractor, all things parking lot. Uh, we had a question about the uh, closer. Who's the closer right now in your mind? I I really think Mc, James McCarthy. He got off to a bad start and tried to give up some cheap hits early uh, in his first two or three outings. Um, but he's I, I, he's he's got the stuff. I mean, it's you know, it was for all we talk about the the Reagan's trade and and even the Nelson Velasquez trade. It was less than a year ago that the Royals traded a low-level prospect in the complex league. Uh, Junior Marin, I want to say, dude could hit, but like was like already listed like 250 pounds and he was like 19, 18 years old for a reliever that the Phillies had just designated for assignment. And we both were like, why on earth are they giving up any talent for a guy that literally was just waived? And, you know, if they played their cards right, maybe they could just claim him off waivers. They wanted him so badly that they were willing to give up talent for it. Um, and here we are now. He's got, what did you have, two strikeouts today? I think he, he had yeah. came into the game. Yeah, so he's up to 11 strikeouts, one walk uh, on the season. His, his FIP coming into today was 129, and that'll go down. He gave up a base runner today on an 0-2 pitch. He hit he hit the back foot of, uh, I think it was Gavin Sheets, and then you know came back and struck out uh, Eloy Jimenez to end the game. I mean, his slider has always been excellent. His sinker today was moving in the opposite direction more than I've seen it move in a while. Like I just, he has good stuff. He legitimately, it's not just a, he's not just a good, you know, better than the other options, better than Will Smith. That's how he got into that role. I'm perfectly fine with James MacArthur being this team's closer. No, is he Wade Davis? No, I'm sorry. He's, he's not Greg Holland. Probably not Joaquin Soria, but is he good enough to be a contender, uh, be be a closer on a contender, yeah. For now, he's not the problem. I mean, they may need some depth in the bullpen. 
they don't need another another closer. I, I'm very happy with the way he's been pitching. Um, you know, yes, and 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 you mentioned the strikeout thing. Is it possible that they're zigging when everybody else is zagging? That that hitters are now, you know, gearing up to face swing and miss guys, and and so you're more likely to roll over the ball and you know make bad contact, or is that the fatal flaw? Is that the thing that scares you most? The it, lack of the lack of swing and miss. It's a really good question. It does it does worry me a little because like you don't want to be dead last in anything, right? <laughs> like if they were ninth or tenth, or okay, you know, you don't want to be dead last. But there are some benefits. One is the reason that they are last in strikeouts, one of the reasons is they're not a staff of hard throwers, which is not something you want to be, but at the same time, the correlation between velocity and injury risk with pitchers is becoming hard to ignore because when, you know, the average pitcher in Major League Baseball threw 91 or 92, which wasn't that long ago, then, you know, the benefits of being a harder than average thrower were there, but you could be harder than average and still not be at extreme risk of blowing out your elbow. Now that the average fastball is 93, 94, if you have an above average fastball, you're into that 95 plus zone, which is really where your your elbow becomes a real concern. And like the risk of Tommy John surgery seems to go up significantly. The Royal, aside from Cole Reagans, the Royals don't really have, and Cole Reagans has of course already had technically two Tommy John surgeries. He didn't he didn't come back from it and blow it out again. And never, the first one didn't take. But the point is he's <laughs> he's had two Tommy John surgeries. But aside from him, you know, yeah, I'd, I, I'd be great if Brady Singer threw harder, but the the fact that he is a, as an effective a pitcher as he is without throwing hard makes me feel a little less concerned about him blowing out his elbow and suffering an injury of some sort between now and the end of the season. So when we talk about how important it is that the Royals pitching staff stays healthy, the fact that they're not a bunch of hard throwers improves that, you know, the, the odds of that, I think, a little bit. But beyond that, if you're not going to be a, a staff of really hard throwers, you've got to have a really good defense. The Cardinals are probably the, the best example of this over the last five to 10 years. And it's not working out great for them, you know, last, you know, last year now, year plus. But before that, the Cardinals had a bunch of ground ball pitchers, especially in the rotation. Um, and But they had a defense that made it work. And the Royals defense grades out really well. That's the other thing. We talk about like all the things they're leading categories in. They've also got one of the best defenses in baseball. Do you re- do you know how many unearned runs they've given up this year? Zero. Yeah, they haven't given up an unearned run on the season. So that you know, their three hundred four ERA coming in today, which is now under three after the shutout, is actually better than it looks because most teams are going to have at least a few unearned runs tacked on that. They don't have a single one. Their defense has been really good. It it makes that low strikeout rate work. So you know, I'm a little concerned, but. And I think they may have lucked into this a little bit, but at the same time, they looked at the the free agent options. They saw Seth Lugo. It's like, yeah, he doesn't strike guys out, but he throws strikes. He's durable. He's got a good curveball that keeps batters off off balance. And we're going to have a really good infield defense because, oh, yeah, we we have a shortstop at third base now. We have Michael Garcia at third and Bobby Witt at short. Um, we haven't seen Matthew, who, who has a pretty good defensive defensive numbers. Um, he hasn't played at second. I will also say, Pasquantino has looked good in the field like a little bit better than I remember him. Um, so right now, you know, the corner, I know the corner outfield defense scares the hell out of both of us, but the infield defense has been very good and they have a, a staff of guys who generally get ground balls. So they're playing to their strengths there a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there's, listen, there's more to like than not like. There's not actually that much to not like right now. You know, we mentioned Garcia's cold and not striking guys out. Uh, they're not perfect, but, it's a pretty good team. And you know what? I, I don't know about you, but d- when Vinny Pascatino showed the ball to the Met dugout after coming over, obviously somebody was barking at him as he was coming over to catch the foul ball yesterday in the seventh inning or so. And he caught it. He had to, you know, he didn't get under it. He had to flip the glove out and catch it and just held it there. Like, there it is. And then I, I was it, I can't remember which pitcher it was. High five, you know, glove tap with him. You know, uh, Vinny went on by, and then he kind of was looking back at the dugout, kind of like that. You don't do that unless you're a confident team. Yeah. They have they have they have a little bit of an edge, uh, and you know, granted, you know, which which comes first? It's a chicken or egg thing, but they they certainly 
Uh, they don't right. seem you don't have surprised. You, by that. Yeah, you don't have it unless you believe in right. what you can do. They believe what they can do. And part of, I mean, think about this. I think out of the 26 guys on the roster, was it seven or not? I can't remember the exact number of guys were on last year's opening day roster. Like two thirds of the team is new. So yeah, last year sucked. And certainly Pasquantino and Witt and Salvi, you know, some of the, the core guys, um, you know, Michael Garcia was there most of the year, Isabel, but like the, the pitching staff, especially, is almost completely turned over. Um, and, you know, they brought in these guys, Lugo and Waka, you know, Cole Reagan's obviously, the you know, basically from the time he joined the team last year, they were a 500 team. So, like, you know, there's reason these guys have reason to believe that they can be a hell of a lot better than they were last year. And they've got a little of an attitude. I like it. So we'll see. We had the question earlier. It was a big deal for me. I want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, the slide that injured Salvi, you have any reaction to it? <sighs> you know, it was, it was bang, bang. And it's like, you know, it's funny because, you know, my brain is attuned to watching the, for the first, whatever, 40 years of my life, roughly, it was perfectly fine for a base runner to, to slide right into a catcher, you know, until Buster Posey broke his leg and they changed the rule and it was a smart rule change. So, you know, I, I still part of this part of me that's like, what's the big deal? But then the, the, the part that knows obviously what the rule is now, it, I, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, he was out anyway, so it, it didn't matter, but I, I'm a little bit surprised that there wasn't more, uh, you know, of a, of a concern about that being an illegal slide that he slid a little bit late. Yes. The ball got there right at the last moment, but there's a way to, you know, and, and the, the, the question is, did Salvi have the right to the base path? He wasn't was, in the base path. It was like right on the edge. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't broken it down. Like, you know, the Pruder film to say whether, he, whether or not he had the right of way, whether the, the runner slid too late with, whether the ball got there in time. Um, but yeah, it, it, I'm glad he's not seriously hurt because I think it would have really, really sucked for him that to have been a major injury for a team that can't afford any on a on a play that was really kind of borderline. Yeah, it um, look if you're gonna have the rule, then let's enforce the rule. Right. Yeah. And so was it the most egregious thing I've ever seen? No, but I feel like were this Jorge Posada in his prime, Sports Center would be going on and on about it. Right. We'd be asking every baseball analyst ESPN has about it, but it's Salvador Perez and the Royals and they don't matter. So it, it doesn't get any run. It irritates me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's, I'm, I'm surprised it didn't, it didn't seem to be an issue at all. It didn't seem to come up at all in the post game analysis. And um, I think at least should have, there should have been at least a little bit of a debate about it. Last thing, um, the schedule moving forward, how bullish on, are you? on how it's going to go with, uh, we know a couple more with the White Sox as we tape here tonight. That's always a good thing, <laughs> right? To have, to have a couple more with the White Sox, uh, particularly the way the Royals are handling business with them this year. Uh, but then after that, Baltimore for three, Toronto for four. Uh, we'll be back at it in what, two, five more games. So um, we'll, we'll check in there, but what do you think we're saying? After uh, throw on two more of the White Sox, three of the Baltimore, four of Toronto. Yeah, I mean that's I mean that's the big sort of wild card in how the Royals are playing so far this year is just how much of it has just been their schedule, right? Because yeah, I mean they've played what now seventeen games, five against the White Sox may be I, I, I made this comp, comp last week the two thousand three Tigers they may be one of the worst teams of the decade. Um, the thing that really you know took us over the edge after our last show was they swept the Astros, which. I mean, Astros, seven consecutive years in the ALCS. But at the same time, the Astros, I I came into this here thinking that this is sort of the end of the dynasty. And I don't think they're as bad as they've played so far, but I don't I don't know that they're necessarily a good team. So I don't know how much of this has been the, the strength of schedule. The next three games against the White Sox, I mean, they need to take care of business. I guess two more games. I'll, I'll be at tomorrow night's game. but Because at that point, they'll have played more than half of their games they're going to play against the White Sox for the whole season. I believe they play 13 against the White Sox, which is, you know, a great asset, but they'll have played seven of those by the, by the end of this week. Um, Baltimore, obviously a much more stern test and they lost to a three to the Orioles um, earlier, but like that was in that, that to me was, even though they lost two out of three was, it was the first real sign that this team might be, might be all right because they ended up, I think they, the, they scored as many runs as they allowed. That was in Baltimore. 
I still think the Orioles are one of the best teams in the sport. That offense is incredible. So for the pitching staff, at least it's a really good test. And that'll be a great series to go out and watch if you're, if you're in Kansas city, Um, because that Orioles offense is no joke. So if, if we can, you know, come out of that series holding the Orioles to, you know, 12 or 13 runs over three games, I'll feel even better that this rotation can, can keep it up. So, um, but I think after that, the, the big thing is when we start getting into the Tigers and then later on the Guardians and the, and the Twins some more, those are the individual rivals that you really have to beat head to head if you want to take this division. Uh, well, they've got a stretch. After these White Sox, it's not just, you know, a couple series. Three with Baltimore, four with Toronto, three with Detroit, three more with Toronto, three with Texas, three with Milwaukee, uh, and then you get four with the Angels. Mm-hmm. So they got they got a stretch. We're gonna know more. Listen, you got to beat up on the White Sox. That's what the playoff teams do: beat the hell out of the bad teams and go 500 with the good teams. That's generally the recipe of a playoff team. Nobody goes 500 with the bad teams and dominates the good teams. So right now they're just doing what you're supposed to do. Right, but they're doing well. And again, when they when they played the Twins, they played the Orioles early in the year. They were very competitive. They may have gone two and four, but like they were. One's you know one out away from being three and three against those two teams. So if you can play close to 500 against the average teams or against the good, sorry against the good teams, that's as as positive a sign as beating the crap out of a team that's just begging for it. I mean, the, they had a mate, guy making his major league debut today, a prospect, good prospect, but still ma- major league debut today. Tomorrow starter is making his major league debut. Um, so you know you, you can't afford to to punt one against the White Sox. And to their credit, so far they haven't. They've won them all. So. All right, 19 games. Uh, that's how many games are in that stretch I was talking about. By the way, the Mariners are after that, and to this point they haven't been a good team, but they're supposed to be a lot better than they've played. But 19 games. Royals sit at 11-6 and six right now. If When they get to play that game against the Angels, the first game against the Angels on May 9th, I said 20-16. and 16. Would you put it in the bank and take it? Well, the, keep in mind, there are still two more games against the White Sox. Yep. So that would make it 20. Well, technically, are those in there? Because I was going to say 9 and 10 in that 19-game uh, stretch. Yeah, three. Did I count those? 7, 10, 13, 16, 19. I didn't. So 21 games. Let, right. Let's call it. Um, let's call it. Um, so 21 and 17? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I was I was gonna say if they go nine and ten against in in that stretch, ten and eleven in that stretch. So ten and eleven, kind of the two against the White Sox. So they even drop one of the White Sox. I think I would. I think I would take that. At least you know, you know, again, if they come out of that in good health, yes, I would take that because ultimately, you know, what matters more than one game here or there is just this this the core of this team staying healthy, that rotation especially staying healthy for as long as possible look every every year there's some team that just has incredible incredible good health out of the rotation I mean, the reds a couple of years ago i think had five starters who made like 161 starts or something like that if the royals can have these five guys make 158 starts this year i'm feeling really good about their chances of being in contention all season so that's what it's going to come down to uh, you'll feel really good after a cold again, asphalt and concrete, Kansas City's best when it comes to uh, handling any and all parking lot problems. They've been making them disappear since 1994. Every project comes with a written warranty. Why would you go anywhere else? Ganasphalt.com. One contractor, all things parking lot, Gan Asphalt and Concrete. So for the good doctor, Dr. Randy Gisarelli, I'm Seren Petro saying thank you very much for joining us here on Kaufman Corner.